My name is Alan Buchanan, and it's a privilege to be able to talk today about the history of Hillcrest. My history connected to it was I was nearby pastoring a church in Grenfell, a couple hours away, and then uh, just felt the call of God to come here, though it was a, not a great point maybe in the history of the church and not something I was aspiring to, but yet God very definitely led us to take up the challenges of senior pastor ministry here. My name is Arlene Richmond, and I have been attending, well, you're gonna find out my age now. I have been attending the church uh, for 59 years. And uh, my mom and dad were just a young couple when they came to Moose Jaw. And uh, they didn't even know at the time that I was on the way. So this has been my church for all of my life. Uh, my name is uh, Ron Francis, and uh, uh, I'm a part of uh, the community that's uh, uh, called Old Guard. Uh, it's about 17 miles uh, from Moose Jaw, but we're also, uh, we've been part of the uh, Apostolic Church and then Hillcrest Church uh, for, well, since I was a child, I guess. Uh, yes, yeah, so O.J. Lovick uh, started off in Regina, was ministering there, and felt the call of God to come to Moose Jaw. In fact, he was quite distinct. In his morning prayer time, he really felt God say, I don't know if it's audible, but say to him very definitely, you need to go to Moose Jaw. And his response was kind of classic. He said, not that wicked city. <laughs> that was his response to uh, the call to Moose Jaw, not that wicked city. Now, I think it was the Roaring Twenties at the time, and you know, it, there was a fair bit of wickedness happening everywhere, but Moose Jaw had some notoriety about wickedness. Anyway, so his response was not that wicked city. He further went on to argue with God, I'd need money, I'd need $300. And why he picked that number, I have no idea, but that's what he picked. Anyway, later in the day, as he was walking to the church to spend some time there, uh, where they were ministering in Regina, he was spoken to by a man from out of the city, actually, I think from Shaunavan, I heard, uh, who stopped him on the street, introduced himself, said there was something about his sister had received ministry, I think even healing, at uh, one of his meetings. And he felt the Lord had directed him to come and give him $300 for, uh, as a gift. And right away that coincided with what he just argued with God, but he was still resistant. So he actually told this man, he said, well, I don't wanna take it right now, uh, if you're back, and he understood the man was from out of the city, so he made this quite difficult. He said, uh, if you're back in the city on the weekend, talk to me about it then. So, you know, not very often would you turn a gift down. <laughs> and what's the chances of getting it again if you did turn it down? Anyway, that's what, he, that's what he did. Well, the weekend came, this man showed up again, offered him his $300, and sort of the arguments, you know, had to be broken down. And O.J. Lovick uh, came, I believe, the next Monday, or like right the next day, the Monday, came to Moose Jaw to look into getting, renting a place and being able to start uh, meetings. Uh, that all worked out. He got a theater downtown, and uh, that became the kind of the hallmark of the church for a while. It met in theaters, but that's, uh, that's where it began, and met in rented theaters, and uh, he wanted, he tried to take out an ad in the paper. He tried to get them to copy some articles that had been in the Regina paper about miracles. The editor was very resistant and said, no, I'm not gonna publish anything happened there. I don't believe in miracles, but if one happens here in Moose Jaw, I'll put it in the paper. If there's a miracle here, I'll put it in. And, but he's quite resistant. Anyway, the date, I'm not sure when, how soon the first meeting uh, happened, but uh, O.J. Lovick was in town and, you know, towards a certain time in the evening, he decided time to go down to this rented facility and uh, got down there and realized there's a bunch of people on the sidewalk in front, like a lineup on the front to get into this theater. And he thought, oh no, somebody was supposed to open those doors. You know, how come they didn't get this place open earlier? And he got down there and discovered that the doors were open and the building was actually already full. And this was quite like, a, I don't know if it was an hour or more. I understood it was at least that prior to the meeting started, the building was already full and people waiting on the sidewalk. This is for the first 
uh, meeting. So it so somehow God was stirring in people's hearts to to come and and uh, discover what you know what this is all about. And uh, in that very first night, from what I understand, uh, the uh, fire chief had kind of been tipped off by the Regina <laughs> fire chief that this guy is nothing but trouble. And uh, somewhere in the meeting, the fire chief interrupted the meeting and said, this can't continue. The building is over capacity. Uh, you know, we got to shut this down. Anyway, they were somehow able to convince him they could stay if they cleared the aisles, which again meant some people had to get out or crowd together more. And they were able to continue with the meeting. And somewhere in the meeting, miracles began to happen. I don't recall right today all of the miracles, but I think that first day or first few days, there were some miracles that involved deaf people being able to hear, blind people being able to see. Dramatic enough that these were known people in the community that when the editor of the paper, who had not been very receptive, heard about it, he agreed to print the stories. And so immediately there was reaction across the community as uh, God you know, showed up in pretty amazing ways. This was 1923 when, uh, when this was happening. So the Roaring Twenties were, were underway and God showed up to put on quite a performance that, that attracted a crowd and so it kept on like that for, uh, for months. Now, I'm not sure how long um, O.J. Lovett continued to come and be the main speaker, but it went on for a long time. They changed theaters. Sometimes the contract of rent ran out and they'd have to move to a different facility. Eventually it became you know, known that, hey, this is a viable congregation. We better structure it a little bit more. Uh, but they continued to meet in theaters, renting theaters uh, downtown and various locations. Uh, I don't know the number of all the different places they they function, but again, so the, the, the mark kind of of those meetings was was uh, known as a place where miracles happen, where God shows up and does some amazing, amazing stuff. And uh, so that was the kind of the kickoff days, from what I understand, of the church. In, uh, again, a number of months, I think later, uh, the first pastor was uh, or came to pastor the church. He was actually a fairly new convert. He was a man from Regina who had been become a believer in Christ through the ministry of O.J. Lovick in the revival that was happening in Regina. Uh, he was an alderman in the city. He owned a business, a men's clothing business. He kind of shut it all down, moved to Moose Jaw to become the, the pastor of the church here. Uh, was actually a pastor for a number of years. There were some long-term pastors, kind of the history of the church, and he was one of the one of those early uh, long-term pastors. So that's kind of the beginning uh, beginning days, as far as I've heard. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> uh, the Old Guard Road story. Uh, <clears throat> um, this is from uh, stories of my uh, parents and uncles and aunts have told uh, over the years. So it isn't firsthand, uh, although some of the results are firsthand. Um, in, uh, back in the 20s, there was a lady that lived about two miles from this place um, on uh, the, near where George Spicer's uh, home was, which is, uh, we now farm that land. And uh, her name was Mrs. Glenn. She was married to Isaac Glenn. And uh, she was a, uh, they, they had no children. They were just very simple, poor uh, farm couple. And they went into Moose Jaw and he, and they went to some services at the uh, Apostolic Church there. And as I understand it, he was healed in some, uh, from something. I, it could have been diabetes, uh, but, uh, it was uh, a very profound thing in her life, and and uh, she started to pray for this community that she lived in, the Old Guard, Tilney, um, oh, a larger area even. She prayed for the people in, in this community that they might come to the Lord. And uh, she prayed for seven years, we're told, and then at some point she felt that God was telling her to uh, ask the uh, pastor of the Apostolic Church to come out and hold services in the Old Guard School. 
The Old Guard School uh, is about a mile and a half north of uh, where we live. Uh, it's where I attended school. And uh, she uh, went around to her community and invited everyone in the community to come to these meetings. I believe it was in the spring of uh, 1931. And uh, I believe that it was uh, Reverend Dawson who came out and held the meetings. And uh, the first night of the meetings, uh, it was a very special and uh, powerful evening, apparently. My mother uh, came to the Lord, accepted Christ, as did my father. My mother uh, had a very uh, dramatic experience with the Lord, and she was uh, laying on the floor of the school uh, after being prayed for. And they took her home that evening, and she lay on the on the uh, on the uh, wagon uh, bottom, just loving the Lord and being uh, being in his presence, it seems. And it was that um, experience that told my grandfather that this was real. Uh, what, what she was experiencing was real. She wasn't one to put things on. And so he, he had a sense that there was reality in what they were hearing and seeing for the first time. I read something my father said, uh, wrote actually, that this was uh, the first time that he'd ever really knew anything about God other than some far off concept. And he accepted Christ that night. And it, uh, it was a life changer for them, for their families and for future generations. Um, I was thinking of some of the families that, uh, that uh, from the community that were impacted. Uh, there was the Lewis family, the Francis family, Forge family, Davis family, Tremaines, uh, Brody, uh, McWilliams, and uh, oh, a number of others, I suppose, that I not thinking of right now, but a number of those families became active part of the uh, of the Apostolic Church in Moose Jaw. Uh, the The teaching of the day was that people that uh, Christians should come out and be separate, and so uh, uh, became the thing that they separated the people from this new movement, separated themselves from the community to a large extent. And uh, even families were split and or divided, let's say. Um, perhaps the negative part of, of this movement divided in their uh, uh, allegiance to a church. There was a United Church uh, at Tilney, which uh, many of the people had been involved with. So this was uh, something new. And, and uh, it, I, I heard my mom talk that maybe they didn't do things too wisely all the time uh, as they developed. But these people uh, met together a lot. They would get together, pray. They would play together. They, we heard of many, uh, oh, jam. The young people would get together and jam, uh, you know, with, saxes and and uh, all the different musical instruments of the day uh, so uh, it became a community within a community in many ways uh, that's the story that i know of uh, and uh, i guess you know i'm a, i'm the uh, third generation i wasn't at that particular there at that particular time i came along uh, well, probably 15 or 20 years later, but uh, it impacted. Uh, it, it, it's impacted in our, in our family. It's impacted five generations already. Uh, what God did in those very special uh, times it impacted my grandfather, grandmother, 
My grandmother actually passed away about a year later uh, after the, uh, uh, this revival, let's call it, at uh, Old Guard School and, and uh, her family was left without a mother. But uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, my father, my mother, uh, myself and my siblings and our families, uh, our children and now grandchildren who have come to know the Lord and make him the center of our lives. So this little movement that happened at Old Guard School in 1931 uh, has had a tremendous impact <clears throat> from the people that that uh, from the people that were touched in those days there have been a number of uh, pastors uh, uh, lay workers uh, even missions and uh, people who have served in so many different ways in churches all over all over the world, actually, uh, just out of this little school, uh, which, uh, you know, seemingly unimportant, but because one lady was obedient to God and had that sense and prayed, uh, our lives are changed eternally. And we are ever so grateful for that change. The uh, when I uh, and I became uh, part of this, uh, the, the services were still being held at Old Guard School. This would be probably in oh, 50, around 1950, uh, uh, somewhere in there. And I went to Sunday school at Old Guard School. So, uh, services were held there until probably the 60s. So uh, they would have an afternoon service. And the pastor would come out from Moose Jaw and take the service. And uh, we'd get out our hymn books and sing. And then there'd be Sunday school classes. And I remember uh, the classes, uh, there was an old bunkhouse that we had classes in. Uh, there being a class held in the coal bin, <laughs> in the, in the, underneath this school, I guess, uh, some kind of a bin where the coal for the furnace was. You know, they were looking for space. And another was uh, held in a car. So the flannel graph board, I guess, would be, you know, kind of up in the, in the dash of the, uh, you know, the window and the kids in the crowd in the back seat, the teacher sitting in the front, kind of leaning over the back, uh, just a car jam full of kids. And that was a classroom you know, for this, you know, new Sunday school that was getting going. So that functioned again, I'm not sure how many years, but gradually, like in the rest of the community, these country schools closed and students began to be bused to town and, you know, things amalgamated. And so gradually, these people began to come more and more to Moose Jaw and became a part of the church in Moose Jaw. But so that was the old guard clan. And there's still a number of uh, people in the congregation that thought was their, that was their roots. So if you find out where old guard is, you'll find in that area, there's a number of believers. So that's where they came, you know, that's where they came to know the Lord, them and their grandparents before them at that uh, at that revival that was happening really yeah like the Lewis families Lewis's uh, Francis's Forges uh, there are a number of others but uh, yeah just made quite an impact you know right till this day yeah you asked about the radio uh, ministry there was a radio ministry actually for several years in the church and uh, I don't know what all started it, but a number of pastors over the years kept that ministry up. And, uh, and uh, there was people from the congregation involved. There was a choir I know that was involved. I've run across people over the years that talk about, yeah, when I was lived in Wusha, I was in the choir. I was in fact in the radio choir, they would add, you know, because that was kind of significant. I remember sitting on the platform as they, as the, uh, tape was rolling and uh, we'd have, you know, we, and everything had to be just synced. And as a young girl having to learn to, to sing and not make a mistake, <laughs> it was so nerve wracking. Just about like this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was always what we would listen to just before we go to church on uh, Sunday night services. As we would listen to that either on the way there or just before we left. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was neat. And I, re 
I, re I we sang, I sang, my brother and I sang, and my sister sang trios and stuff. So we did it. We uh, got did a lot of singing, and uh, um, so it was it was a a good way to learn um, and be involved. That was um, you didn't have to. It wasn't performing. It was just uh, um, you would you just did it unto the Lord. And, but I do remember that uh, my brother, who was a very good singer, still is a very good singer, uh, he was only three when he started to sing. And I remember Mrs. Ross and I, uh, would, would give him a quarter every time he sang. <laughs> so, <laughs> which was a lot of money back in those, in those days. You could get a whole bag of candy for that. <laughs> Anyhow, so. In fact, my parents were new believers. We lived in Saskatchewan, southern Saskatchewan. My parents were brand new believers, and I could recall as a young kid, like, like six, seven years of age, my parents beginning to listen to the radio, to gospel programs. They had become believers, so it kind of changed our, our home a little bit. And I'd hear them listening to gospel programs and music, and I recognized this Years later, I guess I should put it that way, years later, I met a person and I recognized his voice right away. And here he was the radio preacher from Moose Jaw. And my parents listened to that gospel program, you know, when they were just brand new believers. It was part of what helped them mature and grow. There was, in fact, a lady in our church uh, for a number of years who served in a variety of ways, just an amazing person, Eva Hudson was her name and just served in various, you know, many ministries in the church over a lot of years. And she actually came to Moose Jaw because of the radio program. She listened to the radio program at home and was looking, she didn't have a church community that she felt supported in, like uh, that was really preaching the true gospel, and, but she heard it on the radio. And so when she chose a place to go, when she left her home area, she came to Moose Jaw because of that radio program. That, you know, she already had a home, in a sense, in that church. And I don't know if that happened with others, but she was pretty, you know, clear about that. It was part of her story. She came to Moose Jaw because of that radio program. So, yeah, I went on for, uh, I'm guessing it was probably into the 80s uh, when that was still uh, a viable program that was out over the, over the southern Saskatchewan area. Yeah, C-H-A-B. Well, if you read some church history and church growth history uh, from years ago, an innovative, a pretty in considered pretty innovative, was having a bus ministry to bring children to Sunday school. And so there were some huge Sunday schools known in North America for this unique thing. Well, I don't know if Musha even knew that it was happening anywhere else, but they began to do it here. They began to bring people to Sunday school on these buses. Now, some others could tell it better than I, about the detail. From what I understand, they had a couple of vans that even would go into smaller areas, like little feeder routes, I guess, come drop, you know, and then meet the big bus at this certain corner, empty the vans, get into the big bus, and eventually the big bus would end up at the church. Now, I, from what I understand, again, I don't know all the numbers real clearly, but that the Sunday school was in the neighborhood of 300 kids in the Sunday school. I mean, that was way bigger than the congregation itself, the number of kids that were coming on these on these buses. So it was a major thing. There was th at least three I'm aware of. Uh, there may have been more at other times, but three buses. And so there was this whole team of, of bus drivers and bus captains, you know, kind of that were, you know, and they'd have these uh, sort of blitzes to go around in the community, invite people, you know, at the end of the summer, invite people, you know, join our Sunday school. We'll come by. We Here's when our bus comes by, just like a school. And, you know, you could, you could be a part of that. So that went into, I'd say again, into the early 80s. And again, a lot of Sunday schools did the bus ministry like that till about that period of time. It began, buses became way more expensive, fuel became way more expensive. There were lots of cost factors that began to hinder that, that ministry. The buses were getting kind of wore out. Uh, and again, there's, there's all kinds of interesting stories. If you, you find somebody who was a bus driver at one time, in the congregation, you'll get a lot of interesting stories about, you know, the the fun they had bringing these kids in and and uh, the impact on them. They used to do a big event at Easter every year, uh, several days long, like two or three days long at least, 
uh, Easter happy hour, they called it. Now that word would have all different connotations. <laughs> eh? But it was called Easter happy hour, I think is what it was called. But it was known in the city as this big Easter thing that you'd send your kids to, you know, when they're out of school for that whole week. I mean, what are parents gonna do with these ruffians? Eh? Get rid of them, send them to church. But uh, the church at that time was downtown, which now is the uh, Church of God. That was the building we had. So it was a good sized building to be able to handle a lot of kids. But it was in no way handled all the kids that came for Easter. So close by was the St. Andrew's United Church. And they would had a partnership with them to use their building for that event as well. And, and just hundreds of kids would be gathered up by those buses and others. You know, they'd have to add other transportation for that event. But just on a regular week by week thing, yeah, there's at least three school buses at one time and then these vans besides and, and bringing kids from homes where otherwise they would not have, you know, would not have been going to Sunday school that they were sending them. So again, pretty innovative for its day and uh, made a major impact on a lot of people. A lot of people had to serve to make it happen. I mean, right from mechanics on to drivers and, you know, just organizers and uh, to make it all happen. But it was a, it was a big deal. Summer camps were uh, a big part of that too. And in fact, the buses, you know, would run, uh, you know, kids could sign up to go to camp and they could just show up at the church and catch the bus you know, to get to camp too. So, so it became, it was a, it was a pretty major, major area of ministry for people to serve in and made a difference in a lot of people's lives that, you know, that was the only way they ended up coming and hearing the gospel. So yeah, good, a, a pretty interesting era of uh, history. Yeah. I've, one of the things perhaps is that I've known um, a number of the pastors at Hillcrest <laughs> I guess I've known all of them, <laughs> for uh, except the very first one or two. Uh, first one I remember is uh, E. L. McRae. Uh, that's uh, he was uh, uh, just a really friendly uh, man. My my dad just thought the world of him. He liked to fish, so that, you know that's uh, uh, that uh, he and Dad got along well there. E.L. they called him Doc McRae, and uh, he went from here to Regina. Then there was uh, Lorne Pritchard, uh, who was a great Bible teacher. He, uh, uh, he brought a lot to the uh, church that, uh, in the area of, of getting um, of, uh, the love for the scripture. Uh, and then, uh, came Dan Breen. Now, Dan was a, an exceptionally personable person, uh, just loved on people, visited, and was a tremendous, uh, uh, tr tremendous person to draw in the community, had radio stations that impacted our whole province. Uh, one of the, the pastors that uh, made a big impact on, on my brother was Brother Breen. In fact, he even would carry a picture of him in his wallet. I always thought that was so cute, this little guy. And it was Brother Breen. He was <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, he, he became, as a young child, um, the, pa Brother Breen had made such a, an impact on him that even as a young, like four-year-old boy, he wanted to become a pastor, and, uh, and w which he did. After him came uh, George Nielsen, a return missionary, and he was an organizer and a, a structure person, just uh, uh, just what the church needed at the moment because they were um, uh, they were uh, in need of that kind of uh, ministry. A great, great had a great ministry. Oh, let's see after. Uh, after Niels, Brother Nielsen came, uh, I believe it was uh, Kurtz, was it Pastor Kurtz? And uh, Pastor Kurtz had a real heart for people who, who, had, uh, who were uh, struggling in many ways. He had a, just a tender heart toward people. A uh, very soft-spoken man. And, and, uh, and then uh, 
um, was it Randy Levitt, I believe, was the next one. And uh, Randy came from Eastern Canada and was with us for several years while the church was being built and helped to build it. And uh, while the new church at, Hill, at Hillcrest was being built and helped to build it. Uh, after he left, it was, uh, hmm, I should have written this down, I think. Hmm? Oh, Pastor Vaughn came from the, uh, the States and, uh, and, and uh, ministered for about three years uh, to us. And then Cameron Gillette was here. Uh, and then uh, Bob Tauber uh, spent uh, a, a short period of time as an interim pastor. And then uh, Alan Buchanan came. So uh, there's been a lot of pastors in, uh, in our history time that <laughs> probably have been mentioned before, but I, uh, I think it's worthy to uh, mention just the specialness of each one and what each one brought to this congregation. And that one, that what we are today has been uh, built on uh, the ministry of many uh, good pastors. And uh, we're, we're privileged to be a part of that. And then uh, I should mention uh, Dave, who has just left us, uh, Dave Wicks, and now Pastor Steve. That's a lot of pastors. Yeah. Besides that, there have been a number of, um, of youth pastors who have really, uh, I should say that children and youth have been a real powerful part of our church for many, many years. And uh, so youth pastors have been uh, a very important, and youth leaders. Well, I, I, mean, I perhaps could mention that the, um, in the earlier days of well, when I was young, uh, there was a May rally from which people came from all over the province to uh, be a part of. It was a, uh, a big deal. One of the things my mom and dad were involved in, it was... Um, the May long weekend, and it was an, really all the young people would come, and um, there were services and singing, and uh, there we had um, um, uh, Bible quiz um, teams, and uh, so they would practice. You know, they would compete and. And so then you'd, you'd have all these teams and it worked, worked down to the last two teams to see who was the winner. And, and uh, yeah, there was some really good, really good um, times being part of that on the May long weekend. My, my first visit to Mushta happened in those, maybe in those years, I guess I could say, probably late, um, mid, uh, let's see, late 60s, <laughs> dating myself here, but late 60s. Uh, the Mushta Church held a youth retreat. I, I hadn't heard about it before, but I guess they had it every May long weekend. There was a May long weekend youth retreat in Mushta for years and years. And uh, I ended up hearing about it and coming with some other kids. Uh, I went to a youth group in Weyburn at the time. That's how I ended up hearing about it, connecting, coming up here, and was introduced to this church that just has so many unique things for me. That's when I heard that voice, like I mentioned. Happened to hear this guy's talking and realize that's the radio, you know. So it made these connections for me that I hadn't sort of put together yet. But that was the radio voice, uh, D. W. Breen. He was one of the pastors' unique radio voice, and and uh, he was still the pastor then. There were other youth ministers and so on. But I'd never seen so many young people that knew the Lord. I'd never been at a youth retreat. I thought youth groups. The youth group I went was just this small little struggling thing. And so it was so exciting for me and my faith to run into all these new people that were believers. They were kind of from all over southern Saskatchewan, I think, but it just made a major impact on me. So it was another thing they did in the area of youth that made a real impact. And uh, people came from you know quite a distance for that. And just was a real inspiration to me as a young person to realize, wow, there's more Christians or young people that are Christians around than what I thought. It gave me real encouragement. And, and the other thing that was quite unique, uh, which again was a mark of the church for years and years, because they'd always rented these theaters, the whole congregation were used to having 
soft seats. I mean, <laughs> theater seats. And because I walked into this church, and my experience with church was slatted, painful benches with nails even showing up to catch on your pants. You know, I mean, it, uh, that's the kind of churches I went to, pretty rustic. And so to show up at this church, and here it's theater seats, fold down theater seats. I'd never seen anything so wonderful, you know. And this was a church that they had built by this time. This was not a rental, they'd built. But for this congregation, that was church seating. <laughs> theater seating was church seating. So, so this is a church that always had had soft seats. <laughs> so even now the church they have, I mean, it was, it was a given, you don't, you don't put hard seats in a church. I mean, they had soft seats forever in this one, so. Interesting little sideline <laughs> about that church. At least interesting to me. Quite a novelty. <laughs> yeah, well, as I mentioned earlier, I came in 1992 to Moose Jaw. Although, like pastoring a nearby church, we were connected somewhat through conferences and various things. We'd know about Moose Jaw. We had a couple of the girls in our youth group who actually ended up marrying people who were connected to Moose Jaw. And one actually served with her husband uh, in youth ministry here uh, in some of those intervening years. So we're, you know, casually connected, I guess. So I knew somewhat of the what was going on in Moose Jaw, but I didn't really try too hard to, you know, stick my nose into it, I guess. <laughs> I did know there was problems in the church in those 80, in the 80s, I guess. And as I eventually came here, I realized that this church had grown and advanced and was making an impact in our community, was making an impact really around the world, was touching a lot of, uh, was sending out missionaries. God had really blessed this church. They were sending out missionaries various places. They were helping other groups start churches in Saskatchewan, in fact. There's churches here that were, you know, got their main initial support for getting started from Moose Jaw. So the church was having a pretty profound impact, I'd say, uh, in the community and beyond. And it's like the, in, in my view anyway, is that it was like the enemy just chose deliberately and maybe kind of like Job, I don't know if he got permission from God or how that actually works, but it's like the enemy through every strategy of attack against this church that he could possibly devise in the 80s. So there were, you know, there were doctrinal issues, there were morality issues, uh, personality issues, you know, clashes between, you know, various philosophies of leadership even. There were just a variety of things that the enemy used to just try and disrupt and destroy this work. And there was a time that it looked like he was going to be the, the one to succeed. Uh, gratefully, God's word promises that Christ is going to build his church and even the gates of hell are not going to prevail. The enemy's not going to win. But there were days, I think, in the history of this church and the people that were here would, could speak to it better than I could. There were days that it looked like he's winning. It was, there were some tough, 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 tough times. Now, a lot of that had already happened and some of it was even on the mend, you know, something you're mending before I came. But there still was some, some very definite struggles happening. In the meantime, the congregation had decided to build a new, a new church. There was every reason to do so because of the growth of the congregation. They looked at expanding their current facility and just finally chose, no, we'll, let's start new, uh, let's build new. I mean, there was, they're bursting at the seams. That bus ministry was thriving. Like there was just lots of reasons why they needed to build. And so they launched a building program. So this is happening. And, but, but there's this undercurrent of all the things the enemy is throwing at the church or preparing to throw at it. Now it's, it's, it's my perspective, looking back in history, it probably looks a lot better, uh, or not better, but maybe clearer than it did back then. It just was confusion and turmoil and a lot of pain. And, and it was a tough, tough time for the church. The end result is they're in a, they're in a building program that's you know, costing a lot of money. Interest rates shot up. At one time, interest rates were 24% on construction money you know, in those days. It was horrendous. 
And those things couldn't have been planned for really, you know, when they got into it, but that's what that was happening. In the meantime, the church had a major split, I guess you'd call it. Um, various factions, and again, it's really tough to determine, you know, was there one side that was right, one side that was wrong? There's great people on both sides, but there were differences. And it came to a head in this, you know, in tumultuous times. And uh, sure, maybe there were things could have been done differently. No doubt there could have been. But the enemy was out to attack and destroy and came pretty close to succeeding. They ended up being a split. Some have told me it was like a three-way split. It was those who split off and started another church. There was those who remained. And there were those who just disappeared to get away from the, the tension and the squabble. They just where they were at spiritually in their life just was not a good time for them to be in this kind of a troubled spot. And so it made perfect sense for them to get somewhere that's healthy. Anyway, that, that happened. So now suddenly the church is a third of its size and it's in the middle of building a building that will seat three times what it would have been, you know. I mean, it was, you know, suddenly they didn't need this new church. They didn't need these debts. They didn't need to be, you know, uh, but they chose to keep going, pressing on, did, you know, doing the best they could. But it, it was really tough, challenging time. So financially, it was just about impossible. Uh, it was a real challenging time for the church. It went through a, two or three different pastors that sort of brought new strengths that helped out. And then again, some other little disasters along the way. And so it just was a bad decade all around. And uh, so I was glad it didn't come till the next decade. It kind of was a, there was already a bit of a turnaround happening when I came, but it was pretty, still pretty dark uh, when I came. Uh, I remember when God began to impress us about coming. At first, in fact, I, I foolishly made a joke about it once, just say, yeah, I, you know, we're talking, about, Darlene and I were talking about sensing God was stirring us, but should we be going somewhere else or not? We liked it where we were, things were good. And I just made a joke saying, uh, you know, Darlene was wondering where, we, you know, are we going anywhere or staying? And I said, I'm gonna hold out, you know, as if it's the prize that everybody bought. I'm gonna hold out for Moose Jaw. I said to her, it terrorized her. <laughs> she did not want to hear that because uh, it was not the attractive place at that time. We didn't say it quite in O.J. Lovick's words, but I think Darlene was thinking, not that wicked city. <laughs> uh, the mayor's son had just been kidnapped off the steps of the swimming pool. There was rumors of various occult things happening. And there, you know, those were getting in the news a little bit. And so we just had little kids. We didn't want to go to that wicked city. <laughs> but over months, God worked in our hearts and in Darlene's heart, and we realized, no, this is, we were to accept this call to come. And so it, it was a number of months, but eventually it all came together and we, we came to Moose Jaw with a lot of fear and trembling and not, I was not very clear about, you know, what am I to do there? Like, what's the answer to this? Uh, other people would tell me, well, if I was going to Moose Jaw, this is what I'd do. And I'd say, well, why aren't you going to Moose Jaw? <laughs> Because uh, partly I, I, I knew I was supposed to go, but I felt really foolish. At least talking to other ministers, I felt foolish. And well, in fact, I usually wouldn't admit it, but I didn't know what I was going to do there. They all seemed to know what should be done, and I didn't. I had felt God deal with my heart about going, and I felt Him impress me strongly, go to Moose Jaw and stay in Moose Jaw. So I just, I just took from that to be long-term, whatever that meant, and I'm to go there and stay. I'm to ride out whatever storms, you know, are still there. And uh, so I came. I sort of had the impression uh, about the church. In fact, I described it to somebody this way. I said, uh, I think the church is like somebody who's been in the hospital for major surgery. They could stay a few more days, maybe get a little better, but really it's time they got out. Yeah, they're not perfect. They're still hurting. It hurts when they get up and walk. You know, it's painful, but the best way to recover now is get out of the hospital, get back into as much normal routine as possible. So I sort of, I'd tell people that in the church. I began telling people, I think that's where we're at. You know, we've been in the hospital a while, we've recouped, you know, quite a bit, and we're not gonna get any better just sitting around looking at ourselves and, you know, poor me and 
kind of thing. It's time we started thinking about others again. It's time we, you know, started looking at our city. Our our impact in the city was t way, you know, was diminished a lot because of the trouble that had happened. The reputation probably was affected, but uh, it was pretty. It was scary in a lot of ways, but God began to do some great things and began to bring in new people and just began to build some good things where I began to have some hope again. There were some, there were some discouraging days. I don't know, some people talk about what, tell me the golf course story. Maybe they ask that because I don't golf, so I, I rarely have anything to do with golfing. But the church, for those that don't know, the church is nestled right between two golf courses. And uh, I could step out the door of the church and walk on the golf course fairway. And so sometimes I would do that. In those early days, it would be depressing to be in the church, in the building, actually. It was sort of depressing. Big empty office. It was five offices, all empty. Uh, just, you know, it was, it was sad. Anyway, I walked out of this, this one day, kind of quite discouraged, I guess. Walked out onto the fairway beside me. There's a little bit of a hill. And I remember sitting down on the hill and I could look back at the building and it was depressing. It was, I was, it was a tough day. The enemy was, you know, discouraging me, I guess. And uh, I was sitting on that hill and I remember in fact asking God again, would he clarify the mission and vision? What, what should I be doing here? And I was still questioning, am I just here to help this thing have a decent burial? Or is there going to be a resurrection? You know, is there going to be, is this place going to survive? And so much of it seemed connected to the building, which I knew is just like it's a huge debt. And, you know, are we supposed to get rid of the building? I had all kinds of questions for God. And uh, I remember laying back on the side hill, laying back, looking up into the sky. And, and uh, it was a dark, cloudy day just fit my depression <laughs> for the day, I guess. You know, fit my gloomy mood. And uh, I shut my eyes for a few minutes and opened my eyes and I hear a hole had opened up in these big, dark, rolling clouds. This hole had opened up and above the clouds, the sun was shining. And here, if that hole, just the way it worked out, the, the light coming through that hole just lit up that church building and the parking lot around it. It just, it was bright, like bright daylight, right in that spot. And, uh, you know, I don't know how significant that is or even how rare it might be. But for me that day, it was, it was just a fresh sign of hope that the light's gonna shine again. And God has not forgotten this place. This is still, he's still building something here. He started something in 1923. This is, you know, almost 1993. And yeah, there's been dark days, but God is not finished. And from that day on, really, I took fresh hope. God is not finished with this. And I stopped talking that way. I stopped when people were suggesting we get rid of the building even, or, or you know, this church should, you know, fold up and whatever. I stopped ever entertaining any more conversations like that and began to just talk about, you know, there's brighter days ahead. There's, because God had confirmed it for me. Nothing had changed really in so many other ways, but it just was God's sign to me, I guess, that the sun's gonna shine again. And so for me, it was fresh hope and fresh courage. And, and I had just determined not to look back and didn't really. I mean, sure there were tough days, but, but it, uh, God began to turn things around to make a difference. The church couldn't afford my salary for the first year. There was a number of other churches had pooled money together and they weren't prepared to give it to the church sort of in case they didn't want to go into a mortgage that we're going to lose the building, you know, and just pour it in a hole. So they held it separate and used it to pay my salary. So I knew I had a salary for a year and uh, uh, the last place, the salary was a little bigger. <laughs> but anyway, the church was that congregation was bigger, even where I'd been, though it was a little town. Uh, but I just had fresh hope that God's going to turn this around and make a difference. And uh, somehow, I didn't know how, but somehow I'm part of it. And so it's been a great journey being part of it. Not, not easy at all, but, but to be a part of that miracle of God rebuilding and, and moving this church ahead. So the 90s for me then became 
years of rebuilding and and uh, restoration of a lot of things that have been been taken away. It was wonderful to watch Sunday school begin to thrive again and youth ministry begin to thrive again. In fact, the youth ministry began to thrive first, I think. You know, they those young people, they were great to let go of any past hurts and garbage and you know, adults hang on a little longer, but the youth didn't. And so it began to blossom and it became a bright spot. I mean, the bunch of young people in the church, you know, just that was exciting. And um, we, we actually hired a youth pastor. Uh, basically, he was a full-time student at CBC. He'd been at Aston College and then went to CBC in Regina to finish up a degree. He was a brand new believer. He'd been saved a few months actually before he went to Bible school. He was a moose jaw boy. Just a brand new believer, but I convinced him. I said, "Well, while you're while you're in school, at least do your homework in the youth pastor's office. <laughs> you know, do something with youth." And he he agreed. We paid him 500 bucks a month, I think, and you know, commuting money to get him to school. And uh, and it became you know it was a great turnaround. You know, we added staff. I mean, that was an exciting step for the church. I mean, at one time they had lots of staff, but it was rebuilding. It was starting over and. And it was just great how God brought in the right people and just you know began to put some pieces together and 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 to see health being restored and you know uh, broken things being healed. I had one one incident in it all. I'd like to tell. Not everybody knows the whole story, but one of the groups that split away from the church wanted to start a new church. Probably a hundred people wanted to start a new church, and they actually asked the former pastor if he would be their pastor. Well, he didn't want it to be perceived that he was the one who led this split, you know, to, to uh, start this other church, because he hadn't. And yet God didn't seem to lead him on anywhere. So he was hoping God would lead him out of Moose Jaw, and that didn't happen. So he was still here in Moose Jaw. This group was starting anyway, whether he came with them or didn't. He, they were, you know, they were starting new. And he finally felt a release from God that it was okay, he, he could, be their pastor. And so he became the pastor of that church. And it was a thriving church, making a difference. And, uh, but over time, it began to diminish. I don't know what all the reasons were, but it began to diminish. So by the time I came, actually, it was a fairly small congregation. And he actually wanted to retire. He was getting older, wanted to retire. And he tried finding somebody to take his place. And eventually he was able to get somebody to take his place and he retired still attended, still was part of the church, but again, it was a very small group. And again, I don't know all the details that were happening there, but at some point, this new pastor decided, you know what, this isn't viable. I'm gonna wrap it up, we're gonna close the doors. And actually, it, it just happened, you know, maybe not the smoothest, nicest way, and it just got closed. And he kind of got, you know, shut out, like, not as if it was his fault, but it was painful for him. There had been people he'd poured his life into and suddenly it's over. And I, I had a good relationship with him. We visited together lots. He had done an amazing job of restoring personal relationships with people in our church. Over the years that he'd stayed in Moose Jaw, he had gone back to so many of the congregation who would have been part of the battle of those difficult days. And he'd made amends where he was wrong and and they had made amends where they were wrong. There'd been a lot of, so he had, he had rebuilt relationships with these people, was respected by them and by me. And so I, I went to see him when this happened and I said, I don't know if you'd be comfortable to come back to our church and attend our church, but I said, I want you to know you'd be welcome. I know the people would welcome you and you'd be, you know, you could be among us uh, quite easily. You'd be an asset to us. And he said, well, I can't see myself going anywhere else, but I'm just not ready to go anywhere right now. I'm just wounded. And I said, I understand. But if you do come back, if you come to attend some Sunday, I said, you need to let me know before you show up. Because I wouldn't want you to be there and I not notice you. And then I don't acknowledge you. And, you know, people might think oh, I didn't want you there, whatever. I just, just please let me know before you come. Well, he said, no, I don't want any recognition. I don't want any of that. And I said, I know you don't, but but it would be wrong if I didn't acknowledge you. And uh, so anyway, I got a call one Sunday morning. He said he was coming. And uh, so I, I watched for him and uh, he came in a little bit late, him and his wife, and, and sat in the church. 
and during the service I had an opportunity just of welcoming everybody to just welcome him and a lot of people there wouldn't have known much of the history you know years had gone by they wouldn't even known who he necessarily was in relation to us anyway and just in very few words just tried to honor him and welcome him and acknowledge that he'd been part of our leadership in the church at one time and and anyway somebody older who wouldn't who I wouldn't think would typically start to do this, began to applaud. And so there was just one or two claps at first, you know, how that'll sometimes start. And I know I spotted right away who, who started it. And they were, they'd have been part of that group <laughs> that would have been right in the middle of the battle, way back, you know, when the enemy was trying to destroy. And they applauded that he was back. Well, it just mushroomed. It was an amazing moment. Maybe again, to, to some, it was not significant, but, but there was lots going on behind the scenes, you know, in this. And, and the, it spread. And there were people who began to clap who probably didn't necessarily know why they were <laughs> clapping. But then a couple of these older folks, I'm saying they're older because they were by then, stood up. And before you knew it, the whole congregation was standing and applauding for this man who'd been the senior pastor for a significant number of years in our church, and then in the city, still in another church for a number of years, and now was, was back. And I don't understand all these things, but I just know that something in the heavenly realm uh, broke that day. Like there was a miracle happened, I think, out of sight. But there was, you know, there was all kinds of things being restored and rebuilt. And, but there was something, something restored that day that uh, I don't understand all about it. I just know that something happened out of sight for all of us <laughs> where the enemy got his next black eye and lost another battle. You know, here was a you know, a chance to have people divided, and instead they were united. And I saw that, I mean, in months and years that followed, I saw some miracles of growth and change happen that I think pertain right to that day when the enemy got smacked down and, and, uh, and you know, it was nothing I did or it was just, God be, you know, was able, I think there was something broken in the heavens and was healed and restored that allowed God to, to work in special ways. And so we saw growth and momentum and you know, just good things happen as, as God you know, restored people, broken people. We saw, I saw people come back to the church who'd been, who had just disappeared, you know, hadn't gone to any church. Saw some of them begin to come back I think they saw a miracle happening. They saw people who had been at odds with each other, now united, and uh, give them hope. And you know, God was able to work in their lives and rebuild. God brought in some new people. You know, and over the time, I began to meet people who'd left the church and realized they were not terrible, terrible people. They were great people, too. It's just while the enemy was having that heyday, he was, you'd get people at odds with each other, good people, but at odds with each other, and, that's what happened. And so it was so exciting to be a part of watching that being rebuilt and, and relationships restored. And, and uh, so yeah, I got to be here in a decade when, when uh, some, you know, some things were being restored and moving ahead. I mean, we got to see some, you know, some forward movement that hadn't been you know, a pattern of the past either. At, you know, at first, there, people were you know, even when new people would come, or the church would be a little larger, they'd see some more seats are filled up. It was always like, oh, that's good. You know, we're almost back to where we were. <laughs> you know, they were still sort of looking behind. So it was so great to finally get to the stage when we were saying, well, we've never been this far before. Now we're going into new territory. We're, we're you know, stretching ahead in new ways. And, and, and we still had some, you know, we were still held back in some ways by the past, the debt in particular was a big one. But God did some miracles there too. You know, the, I worked with a great board of men that, you know, had, had vowed, you know, people in our community, uh, the, the mortgage was held in the credit union, which is local money. 
And there were men in our church who just said, you know what, there will be nobody in this community lose their money because of us. We're, we'll do this. We're going to... And they didn't say it pridefully. They said it pretty humbly because they'd been humbled. They said it pretty humbly, but they knew there was a God of miracles and they were committed to doing their part to make sure that miracle of financial restoration happened too. And so it's pretty exciting for me to know that, you know, we're in the last year of the mortgage. <laughs> I hadn't thought I'd spend so many years of ministry, you know, involved paying off debt, but, you know, here, there, one more year. <laughs> And it's, it's done. In the meantime, you know, God has blessed financially. We've been able to give away money. We've been able to bless others. We just had a roof project where we are restoring the roof on the building. You know, it's old enough, now needs repairs. You know, that's a big, big item. And yet while we're raising money to do that, we raised money to put roofs on, on churches in Guatemala. I mean, that was pretty exciting to be able to do that. I, there was a day that I thought this church will never be able to do that kind of exciting thing. So to see that restored, and other things, sending out missionaries. Wow, that's, you know, there were things I thought, I won't see that happen <laughs> in this, you know, my small faith. But God has restored and, you know, gone beyond really in, uh, you know, what he's been doing. And so, yeah, there's been struggle and pain, but there's been just wonderful things about pastoring in this, uh, this era. Man. Quite a story though, isn't it, of, of one lady. Like if she wouldn't have done it, you know, she wouldn't have stepped out and, uh, and invited her. I mean, that would be quite a thing to do in a community, to step out and invite your whole community to go to a church service with someone coming out from Moose Jaw. When I think of my mom and dad, they're just my mom and dad. And I can't, um, I can't look at them and say, oh, they were such an amazing couple. Uh, they always did everything right. They probably didn't. But uh, they were just, they lived and they walked what their faith was. And uh, it just made me, as a young person growing up in our church, want to be involved in everything, because my mom and dad were. My dad was a Sunday school teacher. My, uh, my mom was a Sunday school teacher. My mom was part of Bur uh, Pioneer Girls. My dad was part of uh, Boys Brigade. Um, my dad was on the board. Uh, they would, I think the only time that my mom and dad got a sitter was for at the annual meeting. And so I thought it must be something really important. And so I, when uh, I got old enough that I could actually vote, I was there. And uh, that was just, that's just what they instilled in me, um, the love of the Lord and the church became a part of that. It took me a little bit to uh, figure out that God and the church aren't the same. And, uh, and that was kind of painful at the time, but I, I was very thankful for, even for that because it was such a growing experience. And again, it was just wonderful to get you know, you'd have to ask the question, is God, is, enough, is God enough? And I discovered that he was. And, uh, and that was such uh, an important thing to learn. Uh, looking, you know, like, okay, it is important to remember our past and what we've come from, but we can't live there. We need to be looking, what is God planning for us today? And uh, where are our young people or our children um, going today? And, uh, and not, you know, I, w w I mentioned earlier to you, uh, Nick, that uh, both my husband and I, Doug and I are retired. We look at retirement as putting, we are retiring, as in we're putting new tires on. God has, there is nowhere in the Bible where it says, you're done now, you're retired, your job is finished. We're finished when we're in heaven. And, and until that time happens, we need to be involved and doing and uh, learning. Um, we never learn, we never stop learning. It continues. And so, I mean, our Sunday services with Steve have just been amazing to um, get into the Word of God and to learn more and uh, apply it that week. 
we, we live close to the Hutterites, and uh, whenever we get to, uh, to talk to one of them, his name is Philip, he's very much an evangelist, and he's, so what verse is important today? <laughs> And, he's, and, he, and, he's, and it's just challenging me that uh, don't just do it on a Sunday morning. You know, yeah, so, you know, what is, you know, every day we need to think about what was said that Sunday and apply it and, to our lives. And, uh, and, and I think that um, as we, we need to um, do things in love, we need to... Um, um, like we can be legal and saying, no, we have lots and not, there's all these don'ts, but that's not what Jesus is all about. Jesus is about, he loves people and we need to, we need to love people. There are a lot of hurting people out there and we need to show them the love of Christ. And, uh, because, and there's also sin out there and they need to know that there's, there's hope for them in spite of the sin and that they can give their lives over to, the, to Christ and, and, um, and it can change their life and their direction. Of